those of you who don't know me, my name is Cecilia Vore. I live here in Arden and am an active member of the Arden Club. And I have the honor tonight of introducing tonight's guest speaker, Christina R. Gaddy. Uh, the way I got this honor was just because uh, my friend Roberta Perkins told me that Christina's book was coming out in the fall. And uh, so uh, Roberta and Ted Klein and I invited her. So that's how I got to be speaking right now. So if you have an idea for a speaker that you would like to hear and you think would be of interest to the larger community, just uh, talk to the um, Scholars Guild. They're always interested in new ideas. Uh, so Christina Gaddy is an award-winning writer who believes in the power of narrative nonfiction to bring stories from the past to life in order to inform the world we live in today. She holds an MFA in nonfiction writing from Goucher College, and her work has appeared a lot of places, including Washington Post, Baltimore Magazine, the Baltimore Sun, Atlas Obscura, something called Bitch Magazine. Yeah, I, I'll have to look that one up. And it uh, sounds like right up my alley. And many smaller history and music publications. Uh, the range of her writing is great. And just to give you an example, her debut nonfiction book, came out in 2020, and it is called Flowers in the Gutter. It tells the true story of the teenage Edelweiss pirates who resisted the Nazis. So I hope you'll check that one out. Um, Christina came to writing by way of museums. She has curated, researched, digitized, and archived collections. She's produced field recordings, and she's assisted in creating exhibits at a number of museums and historical societies. She lives in Baltimore in her free time. When is when's that, Christina? I don't know. <laughs> in her, sometime in her free time, she used to, no, she does. She weaves on a beautiful eight harness floor loom from her great aunt Susie. And she plays fiddle with her partner, banjo maker Pete Ross. And we're also honored to have Pete with us tonight. There. Um, so here's the book. You've seen it, um, it's up there. I have a copy. I brought it so that I could get it autographed. And you can do the same thing after we're, we're finished talking. If you'd like to pick up a copy of the book, Christina has brought some. And there will be a copy at the library um, if you want to take it out. So um, please welcome to the Scholars Guild, a true scholar, Christina Gaddy. Um, thank you for that introduction, Cecilia. Thank you to um, Roberta, especially for making the Arden Club aware of Well of Souls. Um, so in the book, I explore the banjo's earliest history. And when I talk about the earliest history, talking about from the late 1600s to about 1865. Um, and from the 1600, late 1600s until the 1830s, this is what we talk about when we talk about a banjo. And this is not an old banjo because there are only four banjos of this period that still exist today. And they're all in European collections. One of them is on the cover of the book. Um, that's one that we call the Haitian Bansha. Uh, and it was collected in Haiti, Haiti in 1848 uh, by an abolitionist named Victor Solskjaer. And so this banjo is actually one that Pete made, and he did not make it for me, unfortunately. Um, but instead, uh, it was commissioned by uh, the production company that made um, the limited series version of Colson Whitehead, Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad. And there's a scene in the book and um, there was supposed to be a scene in the show where there are people playing banjo in South Carolina. Um, and it doesn't actually get played in the show. It's just as a prop in a scene. And so when they were clearing out the prop department, they said, hey, do you want to buy this back? And I said, yes, absolutely. Because um, otherwise, as soon as Pete's done with a the banjo, they're out of the house um, for the customer that they belong to. Um, and so to start off tonight, I'm going to start by just playing on this instrument so that we get us 
idea of what it sounds like kind of compared to maybe the idea of what a banjo sounds like in our mind. And so the song that I'm going to play is called Kalinda. And one of the things that I loved about doing my research and that hopefully if you read the book, you'll see and, and experience is kind of the repetition of, of themes and ideas and even music and instruments and people. Um, and so Kalinda is uh, a dance and a style of music that the first instance that I write about in the book is in 1694. Um, but you can also see that it was depicted here in a dance in 1783 uh, in the French colonies. And then also in Slave Songs of the United States, which is the first collection of black music uh, ever published in the United States. They, the authors found a Kalinda song in New Orleans. And I had somebody who's from Louisiana point out to me, uh, you know, in, in a reading, in a Q&A that Kalinda is still very much a part of um, culture in New Orleans and in Louisiana, and people will still play Kalindas today. Um, so this is written for vo voice, but I've adapted it for banjo. And as with any banjo, I do have to make sure I'm in tune before I start playing. So, Kalinda. Thank you. <laughs> so now I want to read a little bit from the beginning of the book, which I think um, kind of helps to illustrate why, why a book about the banjo, why it's important, why I wrote it. So this is from the prelude. Centered between two small houses, somewhere in swampy lowlands next to a creek, three people begin to dance. A woman in a green dress bends over slightly. She lifts her heels, stirring the sandy ground beneath her feet. Suspended between her heels, between her hands, she holds a white and blue striped cloth, pinched by her index fingers and thumbs. Next to her, another woman dances. They look like they are floating. The women face a man. He's bent over too, with a dark wooden dowel in his hands. He raises and lowers the staff as he moves his feet, his blue jacket rising as he lifts his arms, his bare feet and red pants gliding across the makeshift stage. Two instruments drive the music of this dance. To the left of the dancers sits a man with a drum pressed between his knees. To his right, a man in a hat sits with the round body of a stringed instrument squarely in his lap. The tan dried gourd amplifies the sounds that burst from the strings. To our modern eyes, this instrument may not look like a banjo. It has no circular wooden body, no metal parts. Instead, a flat piece of wood bisects a round gourd forming the neck and sound chamber. A piece of animal skin sits taut across a circular hole cut into the side of the gourd. Around this circle, the maker has cut intersecting lines. 
Strings extend from the bottom of the gourd across the soundboard over a bridge that holds them up and along the board-like neck to where it comes to a triangular point. Here at the headstock, three cylindrical shapes stick out from a piece of wood. The strings attach to these tuning pegs. Turning the pegs allows the musician to tighten and loosen the strings to the pitch he wants. Halfway down the neck is another peg for the shorter string. The short string, the flat fingerboard, the skin soundboard, and tuning pegs are some of the banjo's defining characteristics. When the white slave owner John Rose saw the scene of enslaved people dancing before 1790, he felt it was important enough to commit to paper. And there is care in his work, in his brushstrokes, and with the people's movements. Looking at it, you feel almost instinctively that something significant is happening. In the years since it was first displayed, the image has gained the title The Old Plantation and has been reprinted in books, on museum walls, and on CD and record covers. This rare piece of art is one of the most significant images of early African-American music and dance in North America and one of the earliest images of the banjo. Most scholars and historians have assumed that what Rose painted was a social dance or secular celebration. Some have suggested that two of the dancers are jumping the broom, a marriage ceremony among enslaved Blacks in the United States. This reading seems wrong. The painting has no broom. Moreover, the broom ceremony was not a tradition in Africa and hasn't, hasn't been documented in the period during of the painting and is a folk custom likely introduced to the Americas by Europeans. Other scholars have simply accepted that the painting depicts an African dance, even though searches for analogous dances in Africa have yielded no results. In 2017, my partner Pete Ross and I wandered through the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, which explores 800 years of Dutch history through visual and decorative arts. Pete and I play a sort of game in art museums, a kind of treasure hunt that we had always lost. A trained artist and luthier, Pete has spent decades staring at images of early banjos, researching early banjo accounts, and making gourd banjo recreations and reproductions for museums and musicians. Each time we visit a museum, we joke, today we're going to find an image of a banjo that no one has noticed before. The idea of finding a lost banjo image always feels both ludicrous and hopeful. On one hand, how would we discover something new in a painting that's been hanging on a museum wall and been seen by thousands of people every day? Surely we would have known of it already, or we could find it on the internet with a simple search. On the other hand, we know that the banjo's earliest history, its African-American history, has been willfully hidden and distorted. Uh, and here I write only three early gourd banjo, African-American African -American made banjos exist today because in the course of writing this book, a fourth one turned up. Um, and Pete and I are the only people to examine all four. It wasn't until the 1970s that white librarian Dina Epstein published a book outlining pre-Civil War sources that mentioned Black banjo playing. And she admitted that even after looking through tens of thousands of pages of documents, she still hadn't mined every source. Known images of the banjo before 1820 number less than 15. This all makes it feel like we could find a treasure in our game. We chose the room of Dutch colonial art because two of the three earliest banjos are from the South American nation of Suriname, formerly Dutch Guiana. We thought the art would help expand the landscape of Suriname for us and might help us understand those banjos better. Entering the room, we saw a wall of dioramas, each about as wide as a dining room table. As I moved from one intricate papier mache scene of Suriname in the early 1800s to the next, I felt like I had been transported. Then I saw it. There he is, I said, astonished. He's no bigger than my thumb, a black man leaning against a tree. He wears white pants, a blue shirt, and a headdress of feathers. He tucks an instrument into his right shoulder. It can't be bigger than my fingernail, but there it is, a gourd banjo. I read the information card. Vatican from Paramaribo, 1820, by Garrett Shouten. I coaxed Pete over. He looked less excited than I thought he should. His disposition is calmer than mine, but he also wasn't convinced the instrument, instrument was interesting. Feeling that this was probably just another inexact or caricatured version of the banjo, he moved on. I started snapping photos with my phone anyway, trying to get the largest version of the man I could. Pete wandered over to the next diorama. I don't remember his exact words, but holy shit is a favorite expletive. That's it. That's the old plantation, he said. Here was something almost identical to the John Rose watercolor.
And this is that diorama. The fact that there was no banjo didn't matter to Pete, nor did it matter that the scene was in South America rather than South Carolina. And what he noticed in particular was the two women dancing in the center with these scarves and the man, um, his, you know, his foot is the way that he's dancing, facing these women, the man in red, um, down by the man in red's feet, there's these water jug, um, a ceramic jug and a glass bottle, exactly the same placement as in the South Carolina watercolor. I snapped a few more photos and in the gift shop, I bought a book on Shouten and the dioramas. We didn't open it until we got home to Baltimore, but when I dived into it, the next holy shit moment occurred. The book led me to sources and information about the cultural context of the banjo that had been forgotten. And namely, we learned that this dance was called the banya, and the banya is one of the early words for banjo before it became standardized as B-A-N-J-O. There's lots of different names, B-A-N-I-A, B-A-N-Y-A, um, B-A-N, you know, J-O is our spelling, um, and it kind of depends on, you know, the language of the person that was speaking it. The banjo is the quintessential American instrument and an object in our material culture that can tell us the story of the United States. The banjo did not exist before it was created by the hands of enslaved people in the New World. Banjo history is also symbolic of African American history. It has been ignored and distorted. The rabbit hole I went down made me realize that, like a creolized language or food way, the banjo can help us explore the way in which African cultures transformed in the Americas and transformed the Americas. I compulsively researched early accounts of the banjo, which are scarce because those playing the instrument often didn't have the opportunity to record their own history, and white people in proximity to the instrument often didn't care to document banjos. And so one of the first ones that I went to um, is this image from Sir Hans Sloan in Jamaica. He traveled there in 1687 as a doctor uh, to the governor of the colony of Jamaica, and he uh, although he was a doctor and a naturalist, he was also interested in music. And so he attended a festival and asked Mr. Baptiste, who was a black man, to record this music that he heard. And this is the first transcription of African-American uh, music that we have. And then he also collected these three instruments, the two in the front, um, the gourd bodied ones are, he called strum strumps, uh, but what we'll later come to call the banjo. And these are the two Surinamese instruments that are dubbed the Creole banya. So banya, just like that dance and the panya, and then an illustration of the Creole banya from Suriname. Uh, the image on the right is from saint Domingue, so Haiti before the revolution. And that is described as a, a, a banjo, even though the player is holding it up pretty high on his chest, but it's kind of similar position to the uh, instrumentalist in Garrett Shouten's diorama. The one on the right is from Benjamin Henry Latrobe in 1819 in Congo Square in New Orleans. And that's the image of the Kalinda again. Uh, and this is an account from Maryland that I'll talk a little bit more about. <clears throat> I read and reread every available source for descriptions that might be valuable and rediscovered law sources, ones researchers, historians, and librarians had used in pursuit of other topics, but not to er analyze early American music. Along the way, I became frustrated that white supremacy has distorted this history and that better sources don't exist. I used these sources to understand the context in which the banjo was played and tried the interrogation tried to interrogate the bias of writers and observers by learning more about them and the world they lived in. I also looked at my own bias as a Swedish American white woman trying to understand a culture that isn't my own, but is integral to American culture. Our biases have limited the banjo to being a secular instrument in the hands of a lone white man on a porch, a backup instrument in a bluegrass band, or a driver of melodies for a square dancer clogging routine. The assumption is that the banjo must have always been a secular instrument. This is putting a Eurocentric worldview on an instrument born of African beliefs and traditions. From my research, I realized that the banjo once served a higher purpose. The instrument was sacred. It was not just a musical instrument, but a spiritual device and fit into a cultural complex of music, dance, and spirituality. 
In this book, I hope to reveal that cultural complex and have the banjo take us on a journey to remember the hidden, the willfully ignored, the forgotten, and the lost. And so in each chapter, I focus on one of these accounts, uh, some of the accounts that I talk about there, but some uh, also. So I, I begin with that account of Sir Han Sloan in Jamaica and the Strum Strum. Um, but I wanted to come to uh, an account from Maryland um, just because I think, you know, we're, we're in Delaware. I know, I know, I know. Um, but I think there's an interesting uh, dynamic between Maryland uh, and Delaware and Pennsylvania, given um, that, you know, Maryland kept slavery until the Civil War um, and people in Maryland were not freed with the Emancipation Proclamation. And so um, at a certain point, Pennsylvania and Delaware became uh, places that people believe they could escape to. So. Um, in this, I've just recounted how uh, a slave owner named James Holliday of Maryland has sent a banjo to his niece in England. Um, her name's Sarah, but everybody calls her Sally. And uh, Holliday had just been in England and he had been telling them about his life in Maryland. Um, and so uh, Sally, uh, a woman, a family friend named Mrs. Folks, and her mother, Lady Brown, are very interested in the music that he's talking about. Um, so Sally hadn't seen the tobacco and livestock farms that created her family's wealth, and she hadn't seen the hundreds of people forced to labor on those farms. Holiday must have told her about his home, Reedborn, on the Chester River, which is on Maryland's eastern shore. And with her interest in music, maybe he told her about the enslaved people and their musical instrument, the banjo, or as Sally writes it with a French transliteration, B A N. G-E-A-U. -E Sally wrote to her uncle that Lady Brown and Mrs. Folks had come to the house after the banjo's arrival, and Miss Folks longed sadly to know how to play on it. Sally thought guitar lessons might help. In her next letter, Sally told him that Mrs. Folks had found a teacher, and that with the scale of music from Holiday, she will try to make very pretty music on the banjo. Sally predicts that Holiday will soon hear of a new fashioned instrument, much in vogue, invented by the Africans. The name of the instrument, the idea that learning the guitar might help Mrs. Folks learn to play it, and the knowledge that it was invented by Africans demonstrates that the instrument and its origins were becoming more widely recognized already by 1758. What is remarkable is Sally's vision for the future of the banjo. It will become an instrument that entices white audiences. Still a young woman, she doesn't seem to have the bias that her uncle brought to seeing and hearing the instrument. Although she acknowledged that there was a great curiosity to the banjo, in the sense that she'd never seen anything like it before, she also wrote, "'Tis neatly made." She appreciated it as an object. Holiday, on the other hand, was dismissive. In 1759, he wrote to Lady Brown's husband, Sir William, admitting, I did not imagine the banjo could have given them any entertainment but as a novelty and should not have thought of sending so rude an instrument of music, if it may be called, if Lady Brown had not desired it. Although the Londoners found it an intriguing novelty, Holiday found the banjo quotidian. It was common both in the sense that he saw it often and that it was not worthy of note. The banjo was easy for Holiday to obtain. He sent it to Sally just months after returning to Maryland, although he gave no indication of where he obtained the instrument. By the mid-1700s, the banjo was known and even somewhat common in Maryland. A striking yet disturbing example of this is the advertisements placed when a person liberated themselves. These ads often begin, run away from the subscriber or the slave owner's name, and give descriptions of the person, including the name, visual appearance, demeanor, languages spoken, and any distinguishing talents, including whether they were a musician. These ads also provide more information on certain individuals than exists about most other people living in the mid 18th century and show how enslavers like Holiday played close attention to the people they owned. In the years 1748 and 1749, advertisements were put out for the return of three different banjo players who escaped slavery in Maryland. Two of the men had been living near Holiday's home on the eastern side of the bay. Sometime before 17, June 1748, Toby escaped from William Harris. 
who lived across the Chester River in Fairleigh, Maryland. The advertisement urging Toby's recapture notes that Toby was finely dressed, or at least had fine quality clothes with him, a broadcloth coat and waistcoat, both lined with red fabric, a pair of wool breeches, a pair of stockings, a hat, and a pair of old pumps, attire that suggests Toby didn't do manual or field labor. It's also possible that these were not his regular clothes, but items he took because he thought they would make him look like a free man. Toby probably planned his escape well, since he left in a canoe and took with him a new fiddle and a bone jaw on which he at times plays. Playing music was likely part of Toby's expected labor, and the fine clothes came from his owner's desire that he look good at parties. Like many musicians who escaped, Toby was a carpenter and sawyer. Skilled craftsmen, and especially carpenters, were among the most valuable enslaved people, as were musicians. As a carpenter, Toby would have had the skills to make his own banjo. He could have also made his own fiddle, although constructing a fiddle or violin requires more time and precise work than a banjo. If Toby was expected to play music, Harris could have also bought the new fiddle Toby took with him. Toby also took a howl, a woodworking tool used in barrel making with which he made bowls. Woodworking could have also been a way to earn money once Toby escaped. Um, and with that, I wanna play another tune um, called Pompey Ran Away. And it's described as a uh, a Negro jig from Virginia, and it's in a collection from the 1770s of, um, of music. And so the rest are kind of Scotch, Scots and Irish airs as they're titled, but this one, Pompey Ran Away, is, is titled A Negro Jig. And throughout the research that I was doing, I thought how interesting it was that um, escape and resistance were so connected with music. And that was one of the reasons that celebrations across the Americas from New York through the Caribbean to Suriname were banned was because playing music, dancing, and doing religious ceremonies gave people an opportunity to come together. And um, on you know the one hand, very realistically plot escapes. The Haitian revolution began um, with, with music and dance uh, in a vodou ceremony. Uh, but it also gave people the opportunity to come together. And so I know there's a lot of musicians here. And one of the things that I just mentioned early on in the book is that when we play music together, when we sing together, we can actually get our physical bodies in rhythm with one another. Um, and it makes us more trusting. It makes us uh, willing to believe that we are kind of a power uh, together rather than just an individual, which is of course incredibly important if you are an enslaved person that you are part of this larger community and not just an individual. And so one of the favorites kind of mini anecdotes that I tell in the story that's not, uh, not, not a whole story in the book is that during one of these banya prey dances ceremonies in Suriname, the uh, people performing, the enslaved people began singing a song called Let's Run Away, O Brother. And at the end of it, they in fact all got up and ran away into the jungle. And Suriname is uh, incredibly, uh, you know, most of the country is jungle, it's still mostly jungle. And so they were able to escape into the jungle and meet up with maroon uh, communities who had already formed by escaping into the jungle. So this tune is gonna be Pompey Ran Away. Thank you. 
And so most of this book I spend talking about the earliest history of the banjo because that's where I was making these interesting discoveries about the ritual context, the music and the dance that it was part of in enslaved communities. Um, and I'll be totally honest, which was I, I, I didn't want to talk about um, the kind of transition from it being an integral part of black culture to becoming a part of white culture. Uh, one of those reasons is because it's extremely complicated uh, and there's a lot of mythology built into it that's really hard to figure out. Um, but the other big part of it is that uh, it's fundamentally because of blackface minstrelsy that we get this shift. And blackface minstrelsy was white men putting burnt cork on their faces and lampooning um, black language, mannerisms, and music and instruments uh, for the entertainment of other white people. And so that's also, you know, something that's very uh, difficult to write about. But that being said, I was not allowed by my publisher to do that. And they said, no, you have to explain how that transition happened. Um, so towards the end of the book, I explain that what happens there and 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 how cultures mix together and and what happens uh, in the space as as best as I can. Um, so I want to jump forward in time now to the mid 1850s in Washington, DC. A well-dressed white woman peeks through an opening from the adjoining yard, quietly entering a place she wouldn't normally go. This yard is the picture of neglect and decline. The broken rafters of the wooden buildings, mossy roof are collapsing, plaster peels off the walls and an upper window is broken. She and we see a scene that is usually hidden. Behind a new brick row home that, that Eastman Johnson has obscured with a tree. In the painting, there is only a sliver of blue white sky, maybe suggesting that there is small hope of freedom. Two young black girls turn to see the woman coming into the yard where children and adults, men and women seem to be at an idle moment in their day. A lighter skinned black woman talks to a man who has an ax at his feet. She doesn't raise her eyes to meet his but looks at the corn stalks in her hand instead. At the center of the yard, a man sits on a stepladder strumming a banjo. A boy looks up as if longingly at the musician. Another child dances to the music both his hands held by a dark-skinned black woman who squats down. A girl lies next to them. On the second story of the wooden home, a woman and a child look out the window, the action unfolding beneath them. Each person is fully rendered with individualized facial expressions, postures, clothing, stylistic choices, and a range of skin tones reflecting the reality of the rape of black women by white men at some point in the family's history. In the manner typical of genre painters, Johnson paints groups of a few people interacting with another. He used his skill to construct the comp composition of this complex painting, organizing the people well across the canvas and creating the right depth of field for each figure in relation to the others. This rendi rendition of what he calls Negro life also presents a changed expression of black cultural life compared to the art of John Rose or Garrett Schouten. While their works feature the dance as a central scene of accent, action, Johnson's painting is made up of vignettes where the people are all occupying the same space but not engaged in the same activity. The banjo player concentrates on his music and doesn't notice the woman or the boy dancing. The woman and the man talk to each other. The girls at the edge of the yard focus on the white woman coming around the corner who may be looking toward the banjo player and drawn in by his music. But the banjo player is not playing for a specific occasion or dance, and the woman and the child dancing are not doing so as part of a ceremony or celebration. Nor does the banjo look like the banjo in Garrett Schouten's Vajakant or Rose's watercolor. Without realizing it, Johnson depicted what the banjo had become, both physically and culturally. So Eastman Johnson, um, his father lived in Washington, DC, and it has been determined that this scene is um, from the yard uh, behind his father's F Street house. And uh, he would later go on to title it Negro Life at the South. Um, and so this 
you know, today is surprising to many people thinking of oh, Washington, D.C., that's not the South. But of course, it still was uh, in 1857. Slavery was still very much a reality in Washington, D.C. And Johnson, uh, his father was a pro-slavery Democrat, but Johnson uh, was not. And he wanted to paint this to basically prove that uh, slavery was still happening in Washington, D.C. and kind of tacitly approved. And so Johnson's father continued living in DC, but um, he set up an art studio in New York City and he would have to travel uh, from New York down to see his father in DC and back. Um, but he would have to stop in Baltimore on the way between New York and DC because there was no North-South rail connection. And so you'd have to get off um, at the President Street station, get to the other side of the harbor somehow, and then get on the Camden Street station on the South side to continue. And so that's where we find Johnson now. A few blocks north of the water was the heart of the city's entertainment district. Walking between trains, Johnson could have wandered up to Baltimore Street, where the rural south and industrial north were coming together in the music industry. At the shop of William Boucher Jr., Johnson could buy a banjo. If he didn't buy one there, he found one somewhere else, since he used a Boucher banjo for Negro Life at the South, two studies of the banjo player called Confidence and Admiration, and a later work titled Musical Instinct. William Boucher was a white German immigrant whose father, William E. Boucher Sr., was a singer, organ maker, and instrument dealer. William Jr. moved to Baltimore and began making fiddles and drums. When he realized that there was an exploding interest in banjos, he began building those too. By the mid 1840s, he was making banjos and entering them into competitions at the Maryland Institute Mechanics Fairs. The banjo in Johnson's painting is a classic Boucher. The wood is a rich red brown, while the skin that covers the top of the rim is a mellow white yellow. Like the bancha from Haiti, the neck is basically a flat board. Even though the banjo is less than seven inches long on Johnson's canvas, he includes the carved decorative OG below the short string peg and the S-shaped peg head, which evokes the side profile of a fiddle box, as well as early Romance era guitars. The OG and the S-shaped peg head became trademarks of Boucher's instruments. The body is no longer a gourd, but a wooden rim, a hoop often about 12 inches in diameter. Unlike the banjo in Rose's watercolor, or the bancha, Boucher's instruments were industrial objects, not an invention, but an innovation made for the sake of commercialization. Boucher designed his banjos to be mass-produced, responding to demand created by blackface minstrel performances. No two gourds or calabashes are the same, no matter how expert the grower. So a banjo maker would have to have had fit the neck and the fruit together in a unique manner each time. There is no easily repeatable process. With a wooden rim of a uniform diameter, the process could be repeated over and over again in the same way. Like gourd and calabash bodied banjos, some early wooden rim banjos had skinheads tacked on, including the one that Johnson painted. But tacks didn't allow musicians to tighten a skin that had a dull sound or one that had sagged in human conditions. Boucher claimed to be the first banjo maker to use metal drum hardware to tighten the skin heads. He also took shortcuts to make banjos look more expensive than they were, such as painting a pattern on the neck or the rim to suggest higher quality rosewood. <clears throat> Boucher may have taken some of his design elements from the construction of gourd banjos, if he happened to have seen one, or he may simply have copied it from another wooden rimmed banjo he came across at the theaters on Baltimore Street, where minstrels performed. His method of making banjos combined the old and the new, the white and the black, tradition and innovation. By the time Eastman Johnson painted Negro Life at the South, the banjo was everywhere. It had been on stage not just in New York and London, but in Japan in 1854 when Admiral Perry visited. It had been in the hands of white men with their faces painted black and black men who painted their faces even darker. Southern slave owners like the famous banjo player Joel Sweeney's neighbors knew about minstrel shows, as did abolitionists like Frederick Douglass. 
1855, a Boston publisher put out Briggs's Banjo Instructor, noting that there had never yet been published a complete method for the instrument. The book made banjo learning learning banjo music accessible to middle-class white people and provided, quote, plantation melodies, which the author learned when at the South from Negroes, and specifics about how to play and tune a five-string wooden rimmed banjo. And so I want to end with um, a song that comes out of Briggs's Banjo Instructor. And as I mentioned, it's really hard to parse out in these banjo instructors where they're saying, oh, this is authentic. I've, this is an authentic tune I've learned. Um, this is uh, you know, I, I learned this from somebody specific and whether they're just saying that basically to ballyhoo themselves and say, I am the best uh, musician. And so you should buy my book, listen to my stuff, uh, come see me in concert, uh, buy my sheet music, or whether there was some sort of truth in that. Um, and, you know, some of them definitely sound kind of more Western European, if you will. There are some that have some interesting uh you know, syncopation that you wonder, did, you know, where, where, where might you have, have picked this up or where did you learn this? Um, but so the one that I want to play is called Congo Prince Jig. And the reason that this one kind of stuck out to me in Briggs is because the king of the Congo was in fact kind of a known cultural entity. Um, the in New York, you had Pinkster celebrations where you had the King of Pinkster, uh, and he wore red. And Congo kings were known to be wrapped in red for their burials. Uh, red being a very important symbolic color, and of course, the there's the man in red in the South Carolina watercolor. Um, there's the role of the king in the Banya Pre, the Kolnu, who also wears red. Um, and so, you know, Briggs being having the New York influence of being on on minstrel in minstrel shows in New York, uh, the question kind of becomes: Did is this something that he just invented and said, "Oh, it's the Congo Prince jig," because that'll make people think it's authentic, or was there some sort of authenticity to it? So this is Congo Prince jig. I do think we have some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. I'll repeat, I'll repeat what the question is. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the question is, is, yeah, the question is how I chose the tempos for the tunes, and that is entirely my own choosing. There is no, no rhyme or reason to it, really, um, except maybe how nervous I am when I'm playing it and speed it up, you know, um, but because you, you're absolutely right that there is no recording of these instruments, and the transcriptions that we have are... Um, very, you know, few and far between. Um, I will say that some tunes have been described as um, dull and monotonous or slow. Um, and of course, you know, you see the kind of a racist perspective when you, when you hear dull and monotonous. Um, but there is some indication that some of the tunes were slow, uh, but there's others, um, you know, so the other interesting thing about the Banya and Suriname is that that's still a living tradition today. And uh, we will, 
traveled to Suriname uh, and, and saw Banya Prairie rehearsal. Um, so it wasn't a, a public performance yet. It was just kind of working through what they were going to do for an Emancipation Day celebration. And it was incredibly fast. The singing wasn't necessarily at a fast pace. It was kind of long and drawn out, but the drummers were going at a really, really fast pace. Um, so I think with some of this, it's it's a little artistic interpretation of how we feel we want to present it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about the kind of spiritual element of the banjo. And so, so the banjo, we have evidence of it being played um, in the Kalinda, in the Vodou ceremonies. Um, and Vodou is, you know, a, a, a religion in Haiti um, that takes parts of West African religions and Catholicism um, and, and has made it into a new religion of Haiti, uh, but also Obeya in Jamaica. And then the Banya Prey in Suriname is part of a religion called Winti. Um, and so I, I talk about it a lot in the book, which is basically that, you know, these religions um, had singing components to them with kind of call and response singing that we still, you know, associate with uh, gospel, African-American gospel singing today um, and spirituals. But this was something that we saw, you know, across the Americas and those, uh, those dances had that singing element, but the banjo was also a very important part of it. Um, and there's also a very technical banjo construction element in it, but, um, we see even on the physical instruments themselves. So even though this is a replica, it uses a lot of, um, symbolism from, banjos that exist, including the Haitian bancho, which has these cross-shaped sound holes on it, just as the banjo in the old plantation does, um, and has kind of ritual drawings on the fingerboard, as I argue that the uh, ones from 1687 in Jamaica do as well. And so especially these crosses um, are not Christian crosses, but they're representative of the spiritual crossroads to so the intersection of the earthly and the spiritual plane. And that is something that you see especially strong in Vodou in kind of using music and drumming uh, and singing to invoke spirits and invite them in. And the banjo was, was really an integral part of that whole orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, um, one of the places where dances occurred a lot and where we even have examples of, you know, banjo being, oh, this is the uh, an instrument that is being used um, for burial songs. Uh, and so in New York at the burial ground, uh, both in Manhattan, the African-American burial ground there, but also in Albany and then um, we also have an image from uh, San Domain, so Haiti before the revolution, of a banjo being played at a burial ground. And on the one hand, again, if you're talking about, you know, the, the dance and the music as a way to commune with ancestors and spirits, it's very important to have that as part of uh, burials and, and uh, you know, bringing people to uh, the afterlife. Um, but what you get on the white side of things is seeing people come together in these spaces and being very frightened by that. And so you have uh, one of the best examples comes from New York, where these burials very specifically are outlawed by the government. And it says, you know, people are not allowed to gather um, for burials. They're not allowed to gather at this spot. We can't have, you know, more than, you know, first it's like more than 15 people and then it's more than five people, except for on certain celebration days. And that's, you know, 
I, I argue why these celebration days became so important because it was that opportunity. Okay. It's everybody else is celebrating, um, you know, Christmas, uh, or P Pinkster, which is Pentecost or another holiday. So that's the day that people are given off, um, from their labor, uh, and can come together in these communal spaces. But that idea of people coming together for burials, it, you know, I don't, I'm not, I, in some cases they do have a problem with the fact that it's not Christian religion, but in a lot of cases, it's more just the fact that they uh, are coming together at all um, and can have these kind of, as I mentioned, uh, nefarious uh, plots as suspected by the white enslavers. yeah i and i do think it goes hand in hand with the with oh yeah i'm sorry so the intentional resistance um within the music or within the banjo community and i i think it goes hand in hand with um the the religious aspects and the the coming together for that purpose um but really that idea of using music as a way to gain strength from other people uh and you know from each other uh against white oppressors and so you even get that in um it there's an example in in south carolina but also in suriname where during these dances so-called plays the kind of first act is uh, making fun of the mannerisms of the white enslavers and having like a little bit of a, you know, even though, even though there's lots of religion that's going to happen, there's kind of this comedic setup. And um, one of the big points is, is that the, the white folks never really, they don't really know what's going on. Um, and so they're not aware of what this resistance exactly is. Uh, and that's very much intentional on the part of the enslaved of saying, you know, you don't, you, you're never going to understand what's going on here. Um, and so we're going to be able to, to do our own thing uh, kind of at your expense. Oh, yeah. You can say a question from the chat. All the tunes you played were in a major chord. Were there minor tunes or other modals in this music? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they were in a major chord uh, mostly because then I don't have to retune the banjo. So I can play three tunes without having to retune it. Um, but the, for example, um, Sloan's second tune here, uh, Papa at the bottom, that is a minor chord, basically. Um, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play it because I'm not going to risk retuning the banjo. Um, but uh, on my website, I also have a lot more um, music that I couldn't include in the book. That was another thing with the illustrations. And my editor's like, nobody reads music. You don't have to put those, uh, you know, images in there. But luckily the internet exists. So I could put them all on my website. Um, but a lot of the Banya songs are in modal tunings and um, a number of the songs from uh, Slave Songs of the United States are also in modal minor tunings as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where did I, where is he? Yeah. So the question is, is um, Mr. Baptiste who transcribed this music, what more is known about him? I talk a lot about him in the Sloan chapter um, and that research, a lot of that had been, so I'll, I'll read this quote. It says, upon one of their festivals, when a great many of the Negro musicians were gathered together, I desired Mr. Baptiste, the best musician there, to take the words they sung and set them to music, which follows. You must clap your hands when the bass is played and cry Allah, Allah. Um, and if you go to musicalpassage.org, uh, there's wonderful um, adaptations of all of these uh, pieces. Um, 
but so for a long time, everyone had assumed Mr. Baptiste must be a white man because he can read and write music. Um, and a, a friend and colleague, Mary Kate and Lingold, uh, did a bunch of research in the Jamaican archives and basically completely disproved that and said, there's only, there's probably, there's basically only one person it could have been. Um, and there's a couple of people who have similar names and she basically thinks it's a father and a son, but either way, um, it was a, a black man and probably, a, a free black man, um, who would have been educated by the Catholic church, um, to, play music as part of, you know, Catholic services. Um, but he was clearly well-versed enough in both the kind of uh, European written notation and the, you know, Afro-Caribbean music that the people were singing um, and playing that he could take those and transcribe them, which is quite interesting and quite hard because there's a lot of syncopation in that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I, so it's about um, w the kind of African origins of the banjo and, and whether, it's a question I get a lot, which is basically, is, is there a banjo in Africa? And one of the arguments that I talk about in the book is there's no instrument that looks like a banjo in Africa. Um, we have a lot of the same characteristics. Uh, so East African lutes, and there are people who were taken from East Africa and enslaved in the Americas have flat fingerboards and tuning pegs. And then you have West African lutes that some people might be familiar with, um, like Akantings and Ingonis, that have uh, long strings and short strings and gourd bodies. But all of these banjo things, the long string and the short string, the calabash or uh, gourd resonator um, and the flat fingerboard are things we don't see on a single African instrument. And so to me, that's really about that creolization of, you know, like languages, like foodways, these things coming together, being forced together um, to a new instrument that is being used in this African-American culture. Yes. Absolutely. And that was, that's another thing that, um, I like, I like to point out to people, which is there's, there's often this assumption of like, oh, the short and the long strings and, and the gourd, you know, that's African and the flat fingerboard and the tuning pegs, those are European and those are brought together. But as you point out, um, you know, the Middle Eastern lutes and ouds coming into especially East Africa, but also North Africa, you know, they have those characteristics of flat fingerboards, uh, peg boxes, tuning pegs um, that we also see on European instruments. And so that influence didn't necessarily have to be a European one. It could have, you know, come through East Africa um, and even Madagascar, you know, all, all the way over. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. Is the banjo connected at all to the later spirituals with their underground messages? Uh, the question is is whether banjos are are connected to spirituals and their underground messages, and I I, I definitely think that there are uh, they are um, as as I get into the end of the book is both the kind of rise of of white banjo playing and and what leads to that, but also you know where the decline in black banjo playing comes from. And we get a lot of cases where um, you have, you know, these specific examples of people who are religious, uh, Christian religious, basically, you know, you have both white preachers saying you can't, you can't play the banjo and the fiddle, you know, anymore, especially the banjo that's, you know, devil's music. Um, and, 
again, is that, you know, because it's related to this spirituality practice, Vodou, which many people see as, you know, quote unquote, devil worship. Um, but you also <clears throat> have uh, uh, Black folks themselves saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to become a Christian and, and that's going to lead me to leave my banjo playing behind. Um, and so it's not necessarily that those, that music, I mean, so the, the basic answer is that music probably once had banjos in it as well. And you see in a lot of those lyrics, um, the, those, those hidden meanings and in a lot in the, in the Banya Prey lyrics, especially there's a lot of that hidden meaning within it. And again, kind of obscuring what even a white, you know, visitor would see or understand when they heard that music. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be hanging out and I have books for sale over here if you'd like to come and look at it or chat.